Depending on what part of the country you're from or how many clips or images you've seen online, you may be somewhat familiar with the deep orange paint scheme of the Burlington Northern and Santa Fe Railway. This railroad, owned by Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway, is one of seven Class I railroads in the United States. But how did it become one of the most recognizable railroad giants? The answers lie within our past. Let's take a dive into the history of how the BNSF was built. The portion of the family tree that we're going to start with is the Aurora Branch. Originally from Illinois, it was chartered by the Illinois General Assembly on February 12, 1849, in order to build a branch of the Galena and Chicago Union Railroad to Aurora, Illinois. In 1852, the Aurora Branch was renamed to the Chicago and Aurora Railroad, with powers to expand into Mendota, Illinois. A similar amendment two years later in 1854 allowed the railroad to build to the city of Chicago, which would have changed the name of the railroad to the Chicago and Southwestern Railroad, but this was repealed on Valentine's Day in 1855, and instead the name was changed to the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. This new railroad, the CB&Q, was named after its two namesake cities of Burlington, Iowa, and Quincy, Illinois, and was a powerhouse for over a century of railroading. They gained access to the West when, in 1868, they completed two different bridges over the Mississippi River, one in Burlington and one in Quincy, namely giving them a through route with the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad, which was a railroad in parts of Iowa and Nebraska at the time. In 1872, only four years after the bridges were built, the portion of the Burlington and Missouri River Railroad in Iowa was absorbed by the CB&Q. More expansion ensued over the following decades, with railroads like the Colorado and Southern, as well as the Fort Worth and Denver Railways, to name a few that were either bought or absorbed. At this point, we're around the time of the Great Depression in the 1920s, and it would be rude not to mention that the famed Burlington Zephyrs were introduced around this time period. These streamliner trains set the speed record for travel between Denver to Chicago in 1934, with a time of 13 hours and 5 minutes across a total of 1,015 miles of track. These zephyrs were very futuristic looking, looking like something straight out of the Jetsons. Some of these still exist today on display, such as the one at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago that you can see here. Over the following decades, the CB&Q continued to innovate until about 1965, when then-president and CEO Harry Murphy retired, and the former president of the Frisco Railway, which we'll talk about in a bit, took over. Questionable decisions ensued, and the declining financial situations of the railroad across the United States didn't help the CB&Q. The result of all this meant the CB&Q had to merge, and they merged with the Great Northern, Northern Pacific, and the Spokane, Portland, and Seattle Railroads in March of 1970. These railroads combined to form what was known as the Burlington Northern Railroad. Before we go any further with this branch of the family tree, we're going to have to take a step back in time again, back to 1849, with the Pacific Railroad in Missouri. This was originally chartered from St. Louis to the western boundary of Missouri, and then to the Pacific Ocean. The railroad was already off to a rough start, though, as a cholera epidemic swept the city and delayed any groundbreaking of the railroad for two years. Only a year after this groundbreaking took place, in 1852, the Southwestern Branch was authorized and split off as the Southwest Pacific Railroad, which in 1867 became the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad. Some of these old railroads don't have a lot to talk about, such as the Atlantic and Pacific. Besides the initial line building, the only exciting thing about the Atlantic and Pacific was their seemingly endless money issues. The railroad itself operated until 1897, but the portion we are concerned about only lasted until 1876, where the owners incorporated the St. Louis and San Francisco Railway, better known as the Frisco Line. Over the first few decades of the Frisco Line's life, there were multiple attempts by other companies to buy them out and expand, but they always fell short, and the Frisco Line was the only one to come out of these as the non-bankrupt railroad. That's not to say they didn't have their own issues. At the start of the 1900s, there were a few company reorgs while continuing to have San Francisco in the name. However, the n railroad never went west of Texas and ended over a thousand miles away from San Francisco. Even with this, freight and passenger service thrived on the Frisco line throughout the 1900s, with famous specials such as the Texas Special running for over 40 years. However, all this excitement came to an end 
when in 1980 the Frisco Line merged with none other than Burlington Northern. While the Frisco Line merged with Burlington Northern in 1980, if you remember back to the CB&Q, it merged into the Burlington Northern in 1970, so there was a good decade of operations before the Frisco Line joined in. At first, BN dabbled in inner city transport briefly for a year before that role was taken over by Amtrak in 1971. The first expansion of the New Burlington Northern Railway came in the Powder River Basin, mostly located in Wyoming, to service the mining industry in that area. This added a lot more coal trains to the network and was able to bring coal to power plants all across the country. Then, of course, in 1980, the Frisco Line merged in. And besides a couple of headquarter location moves, the railroad operated pretty uneventfully for the next two decades. Now you may be thinking, this is a lot already, in which I would agree with you, but there's still another half of the now Burlington Northern Santa Fe that we haven't even covered yet. So let's step back in time for one last time. This brings us to the Hatchinson, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroad. Lucky for us, the Santa Fe portion of history is a bit more straightforward at a broader view. The ATSF was chartered in 1859 to serve all the cities within its name, Atchison and Topeka, Kansas, as well as Santa Fe, New Mexico. Track laying began in Kansas, and the railroad hit the Colorado border in 1873 and reached Pueblo, Colorado in 1876. Sadly, due to engineering challenges of the mountain terrain of Santa Fe, New Mexico, the railroad ended up bypassing the city altogether. Thankfully, however, a branch line to reach the city was eventually created. One of the Santa Fe's biggest contribution to the future was them being a pioneer in the intermodal freight transportation. At various points, the railroad operated an airline, tugboats, and bus lines. Some notable railway expansions included buying the Toledo, Peoria, and Western Railroad, selling half of it, forming a Chicago bypass with the other half, then buying back the original half it sold, and then merging with the entire railroad, only to sell it back into independence six years later. Objectively, the Santa Fe had some of the best looking train sets at the time, with the nice red, yellow, and silver combination for the chief. Now, on to what we know today. We're all caught up towards the present. In 1995, the aforementioned Burlington Northern merged with the ATSF. This was the first merger of what was known as the Super 7, which were the seven largest Class 1 railroads at the time. This merger spurred the merger of many other Class 1 railroads, which have turned into more of what we are familiar with today. Over the next five years following 1995, the Super 7 went from seven railroads to four because of the mergers. So, this is how the Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway came to be the giant that we know it as today. It currently employs 35,000 employees across 28 states and 32,500 miles of track. Here you can see the two lines from the Burlington Northern and the Santa Fe that combine to make one of the giants of the West. Mergers like this have been a thing of the past after the rush that BNSF caused in the 90s with how few Class 1 railroads there are nowadays. However, the future is always changing, with the merger of Kansas City Southern and Canadian Pacific announced officially in March of 2023. The U.S. government has officially approved this merger, which will create the first railroad to have operations in all of Canada, U.S., and Mexico at the same time under one name. We will see if this spurs any other railroads to connect, and if there may be a fully east to west coast railroad somewhere in the future soon. There is a lot to look forward to in the Battle of the Rails. Until next time.